My name is Kate Velasquez. I'm a marketing coordinator with GSI, and I'm also very pleased to welcome our main presenter, John Bassett. John is Executive Vice President of Managed Services, as well as Chief Te Technology Officer here at GSI. Prior to co-founding GSI, John worked at JD Edwards and has over 30 years of JDE experience. John has experience managing the technical side of implementations, upgrades, and various special projects. John is well known in the industry and is a regular presenter at industry conferences as well as on our webcast. Now, before we get started, I wanted to give you a chance to review our safe harbor statement. Okay, um, now for a quick overview of today's meeting, which will last about 60 minutes. First, we'd like to take a moment to go over a couple housekeeping items, as well as provide a brief company overview. Then we'll turn it over to John to get to our main presentation, which will be about 40 minutes. Um, and next, we'll take a minute to go over upcoming educational events, and then we'll wrap up with a 10-minute Q&A session. If you'd like to submit a question, you can do so through the questions panel at the bottom of the GoToWebinar console window located on the right side of your screen. Please note that the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So if you'd like to minimize your GoToWebinar console during the presentation, just click the right facing arrow on the top left of the console. Clicking the left arrow key will return the console so that you can input your questions. And now I'd like to give you a quick overview of GSI. GSI is a full service JD Edwards consulting organization. We're an Oracle Platinum partner that was founded in 2004 and now has over 100 employees. We have offices nationwide and are recognized on the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies in the U.S. GSI specializes in project consulting, managed services, and cloud and hosting services, with all of them backed with a 100% guarantee. And GSI also provides a broad spectrum of business, functional, and technical consulting services for Oracle NetSuite, Oracle Cloud, Salesforce, ServiceNow, and other enterprise applications. In addition, we are a product development company that has many popular products, including Genius, which is our advanced monitoring and performance analytics solution for JD Edwards or any business critical system on any platform. Genesis is our load and stress testing application for system design, validation, or expansion for JD Edwards or any web-based business critical system. G Shield is our comprehensive security solution for JD Edwards, including password reset and 2FA authentication. Recon Reconciler, uh, which allows you to effectively manage your inventory, in transit, and RMB reconciliation processes for any version of E1 or World. And Rapid Approval is a Salesforce App Exchange solution that streamlines the approval request process. And now I'd like to turn things over to John for a main presentation and demo. All right. Thanks, Kate. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Let me uh, see if you can see my screen. Should say what's new with Enterprise 1923 tools release. Yep, that's right. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll take over from here. Welcome, everybody. Um, today's um, just set the stage a little bit for t for today. Um, it's it's primarily a technical webcast for CNC folks. Um, there is a little bit of information up front that it's kind of boring to just read it, but I'm, you know, I will just just read it. Um, also, this is like a cumulative um, webcast. This is not specific to tools nine two three. It's it's some of the the nine two and higher um, tools releases for people that are on previous releases. I've, so I've made no assumptions really about where you're coming from, other than that maybe you're not on a nine two uh, flavor. So there are some st slides specific to 923, so stick around if that's what you're looking for. Um, but if you're expecting just 923 material, it's, this is not the right, right session. So, um, and we can talk more about that towards the end where you can get um, more of that. So just to, to let everybody know, um, 923 is not yet released. Um, it will be released in the, in the near future. There was uh, speculation rumors and, and hearsay that it was planned to be released around open world, but that's that's not the case. It was not yet released. Um, but there are a lot of features um, that have been described and um, 
um, and, and we can talk a little bit about them. So it could be any day now. It could have even been already released while we're talking. I don't know the answer to that, but um, as of when I did this, um, it was not quite ready. So nine, the 922 flavor of the tools release was um, about a year ago in November. Um, a lot of the new new features that was really big at the time was the UX1, U, UX standing for user experience. Um, that's designed to improve the day in the life of people who use JD Edwards on, on a daily basis. Um, reason, um, a new feature, Enterprise One Search, um, it's been out now for a bit, but it, you know I kind of consider it the Google for um, Enterprise One, a very, um, very powerful tool. If you can't, you know, you might have remembered that you you ran a certain function last week, but you can't remember the title. But let's say you might remember why well, I did a voucher post. You can just type in voucher post, and blammo, it'll it'll give you all of the uh, pertinent data, including the link to get into the program itself. Um, the nine, um, the uh, public cloud has the trial editions available um, on it. Um, I in, in about. Um, two hours time somebody that has experience can get the uh, to get an instance up and running to to do a you know to play with it basically give you a sandbox not with your data but with you know the JDE data um, if it's your first time working with it and you're highly technical give yourself you know somewhere between uh, uh, four to eight hours to get it up and running a um, lot of enhancements to the mobile applications sales order management and healthy health and safety um, updates there are several um, new user-defined objects. Um, there have been media object attachment improve, improvements. Um, user experience one pages. So there's you know, there's some content that's been um, been available um, to you, um, and the ability to deploy and configure um, UX one content as well. Um, there's external forms. External forms as embedded enterprise one pages. Um, springboards and there's there's a lot of, of good definitions for these like an, an external form um, can be used to connect to um, you know ADF applications um, jet pages and, and composed enterprise one pages um, the you know for ADF apps the external forms can also be used instead of enterprise one proxy application um, external forms um, can be used for embedded e1 content in in cafe one layouts so on a springboard, I've, you know, I always struggle to, to, to learn what some of these new features are. And, you know, this is, is this is mostly C and C. I'm not going to get into too much about what these are, but basically a springboard is, is a collection of tasks available to a role. And those tasks can be launched from the springboard pane. Um, and they can either be enterprise one applications, batch programs, uh, one view reports and, and ADF um, applications. Menu indexing um, basically identifies tasks that can be displayed and accessed by a role from a springboard pane um, of a composed E1 page. Okay, so pop-up form interconnects. It's similar to a modal interconnection in that it enables um, a user to work on one form at a time. Um, the good news is though, is that um, the child form kind of appears on top of, a, of, of the parent, so you can kind of see the parent behind it, so that you know you can move around the child window and get an idea of what you were working on if you forget what context um, that, that you were in. So Power Browse Form as a hover form, um, basically the hover form property enables Power Browse Form to function um, as a hover form. It's important um, excuse me, it's an improvement over the previous method of creating hover forms um, from message forms and includes, um, you know, four new system functions. Those are described um, in the uh, FDA design appendix. So and then there's a universal cache browser. It's pretty cool. Allows you to um, view the activity of the cache um, even before you commit the transaction to, to the table. So if something doesn't look right, you might be able to roll it back. So uh, Work Center Cafe One application is now um, role-based. Um, the lifecycle management IoT orchestration components. Um, the, the orchestrator is really big inside of, of tools. It started off, started off as the IoT orchestrator, um, and because it can do so much more, it's not just um, it's not just for IoT applications. It can be used as as basically like an integration platform um, for the power user. Um, so the AIS server is kind of like um, 
Um, I, I like to think of it as like a screen scraper type of application. It's, it's running in the background and it can gather data um, from an E1 um, Enterprise One HTML page. So it's kind of like a hidden Enterprise One client that makes, makes you able to do things like mobile uh, forms, excuse me, mobile applications. So the maximum amount of records returned for that has, has, has been increased. There were some restrictions on that that have been, been increased a bit. Um, oops, sorry. Active content pages um, are now, now available. Um, and you can now have the E1 mobile applications integrate with the Oracle mobile cloud. So you can, you know, kind of have a unified hub where both Oracle mobile applications and E1 applications can, um, can work together. So I talked a little about the Enterprise One search already, and, and to get into a little bit more into the orchestrator, it uses Groovy scripting. Um, GSI had used Groovy scripting with its Genius um, product years ago, so this was right up our alley. Um, but the really nice um, uh, port part of this is that Orchestrator um, has been enhanced to use um, REST-based um, application, or excuse me, outbound REST-based calls, making it industry standard. Some other applications that, that use it, ServiceNow is REST-based, um, Salesforce is REST-based, so this might give you um, you know, a mechanism for integrating um, rather easily into tools that, that you might use on a, on a regular basis. Also, the licensing for Orchestrator um, uh, has, has changed. So, you know, make sure you check with your, your Oracle rep. You might not have to pay for something that you, you thought you, um, you did. So if you're thinking about using it, get with your Oracle um, rep to let you know if you, if you purchased the Oracle Foundation, you might be entitled to use it. So here's just a, you know a bunch of application uh, level improvements. I'm not going to um, read through all of these. You can read them quickly and, and get the idea. A um, couple of things that I will point out is the ability to access um, um, E1 documents um, in the cloud, in user documents in, in, in the cloud, so that, that aren't necessarily related to E1 transactions. So a little more about UX1. Uh, there are many UX1 roles. It's over 50 now. Um, it's it's uh, role-based, um, and along with it, there's a bunch of watch lists, visualizations, springboards, um, and personalizations around around the individual role. So if you use these roles, it'll are UX1 um, tools, and you want to look at these roles, um, you got to be on Apps 9.2, and um, there are data packs that you can load to make it. Um, to, to load some standard content provided by Oracle. So enough of the citizen um, developer stuff. For those of you that have seen this webcast before, this is my, my same, same, same slide. Um, the rest of the talk is going to be highly focused around, um, around the CNC side of the house here. I want to just go through some of the, the recent changes and what happened in a particular um, um, tools released. 9221 was a was a big um, a big release uh, because that's when Oracle wrote um, the interface to allow objects to be stored in the database, file-based objects to be stored in the database. So, what are your file-based objects? Um, media objects, the deployment server files related to a path code, C.h, etc., and print queue files optionally. Uh, along with that, um, some security has been added and also a really cool um, repository history and, and repository application. Anything that is a file-based artifact uh, can, now, um, can now be referenced as, as sort of like a version. You can look at um, every time the object changes, a new copy is created. Don't think of it as interactive versions or batch versions. That's a wholly different um, subject. These are just file-based objects. So if you change a business function, let's say, it, it ends in .c, okay? So that's a file-based object. Um, developer makes a change to it, uh, um, 
it goes into the object repository and a, and a copy goes into the history as you make changes. You can then look back on various changes. Let's say you rolled out a change, somebody said, hey, this feature used to work and then you know, a month ago, but now it doesn't. So you can look through and say, hey, what did we change? And you can find out the exact change that might have affected that. So it, it helps you with your troubleshooting um, and it also um, helps, well, there's lots of features we'll go over um, later in the webcast. Many new platform certifications. I always go to Oracle's, um, you know, support.oracle.com and go to the certifications page. Um, many people uh, don't look it up themselves, maybe don't, don't know how to do it, doesn't matter. They ask, we help. And we just type in um, the particular release of JD Edwards platform just to see what, what is there. And so some of these enhancements were to help stay code current. Um, Here's just some more more features. Again, I'm not going to read um, all of these to you. Uh, they may affect you, they may not. I'll talk a little more about notifications. Um, single sign-on, those of you that have used Portal in the past, WebSphere Portal, um, Oracle Portal, um, uh, Web Center Portal, um, know what single sign-on is about, but now you get that with the Oracle content in the Experience Cloud. So if I'm not gonna go through each of these. Let's, a um, few other things, um, server manager setting to enable external email for notifications so you no longer have to be within your own domain and in enabling task search. So those were all 9221 features. Okay, so then 9222 came out. A lot of new things um, that, that were, were, were added. Um, in designer page of a compose page, you can now cut and paste, um, whoops, I spelled copy wrong. Paste tiles. Um, you can also add troubleshooting information for, um, for the E1 search feature. And this was a change um, that you now have to um, set the security server settings for AIS server. It used to be optional. Uh, so 9222 had just a few changes, uh, bug fixes. Um, 9223 um, was never released to the general population. However, 9224 came out, and there were a lot of really good enhancements um, in 9224. Um, form extension um, that enables users to add available business views to E1 forms, basically a personalization um, feature. And you can see that's on the next one, Us ability for users to hide, unhide, and rename menu exits. Okay, so all of this personalization, um, you know, o Oracle is, is now in many cases saying, that you don't necessarily want to change what is what is on a screen for a particular user through traditional JD Edwards development, that you should now consider personalization changes before modifying the underlying code. The good thing about that is, is you, you may or may not need a developer. It might be able, a power user knows a little bit about the inner workings of JDE, understands the table structures and business views, can now design their own form. Don't have to wait to get in the queue of a developer that probably has, you know, 50 things on their plate. So a new application, P98 um, um, 0053X application and provides the ability to assign subscriptions. I'm gonna talk a little more about um, subscriptions. I have a whole slide on that, so I'll get into that in a little better. Um, the scheduler um, enables you to store the scheduled job properties for notifications and orchestration centrally in the database. There were performance improvements um, with, with notifications, and here's a biggie. Orchestrator 6.1 came out at that time. I think 6.13 is the latest. I haven't checked in a few weeks. Might be further along than that. But also this new orchestrator process recorder. And this is really cool because you can get into the process recorder. You, you get in basically your enterprise one application while you're recording the process and it'll save off um, the steps into an orchestration um, that you can then edit and reuse down the road. Um, GSI has a webcast where we, we, we do an, an example of that around address book. Uh, we, Larry Farino helps us out. He gets in and does a, um, he does an address book entry with process recorder on, then he gets, um, uh, you know, he saves it off into an orchestration and then he creates an address book record uh, via that orchestration. Um, FTP support for orchestrator was added at that time. 
how would that be cool? Um, or, or what would that be useful for? Well, it would be useful, let's say you have a, um, files that normally you, you, you get in from a bank. Uh, so you could write an orchestration that can FTP the, um, the files from the bank or the, FTP, the bank FTPs you a file, and then you can automatically upload it via, via orchestrator. Now, maybe you've got ways of doing that now. Um, but again, orchestrations can be done by a power user. It doesn't necessarily have to wait on an integration developer um, and the ability to launch reports inside of Orchestrator. Okay, tech, uh, along came 9225 a couple months later. Um, it was a bug release fix, uh, and those of us that were CNCs were grateful to see it. it however, was, it was reasonably stable, but it was superseded by 9226. Um, again, a bug release fix only and a very, very stable um, tools release. So here's uh, what many of you have come for, and this is what's new in 923.0. Okay, so um, many of us um, expected it open world, but it was delayed. Um, expected by December 1st, just my guess, just a, just a John Bassett gut feeling. Don't know for sure. Um, when when Oracle gets it right, they'll they'll let us know. But they say it's close. Um, what's going to be important here is this new 64-bit um, support for enterprise servers. Um, there are many webcasts that that um, you know Quest has put on a webcast, and um, my friend at Oracle, our friend at Oracle, have already done a um, uh, an internal business partner. Um, tech release on, um, thank you Clayton, he's on this webcast, but thank you for, for putting on that presentation, showing us the differences between um, 32 and 64 bit applications. Um, you're gonna have to, as a CNC person, you're gonna have to not only understand multi-foundation, but you're now gonna have to understand the concept of multi-bitness. So uh, if um, you, you haven't heard anything about it, it's going to be coming up. GSI will probably do a webcast um, on Bitness to try to help people get a better understanding of it. Oracle is doing their best to release that information to to everybody so that you can understand what is what and what is um, um, you know what what it means to you, whether you should do it, what gains will there be, why you should do it. Um, primarily, the reason for going to 64-bit is going to be that um, future support of software. Some software programs are no longer going to be a 32-bit. So a lot of third-party products aren't going to be 32-bit anymore. For instance, the big one, Java. Java is no longer going to be 32-bit. And as everybody knows, in the CNC industry, there's a lot of 32-bit Java going around in, in the code you install, along with 64-bit. Now, I look forward to the day of being just 64-bit because I've struggled personally, and the, and the GSI CNC folks have struggled with understanding where to put the 32-bit um, drivers and where to put the 64-bit drivers. So it'd be nice to only have to worry about it once. Um, another really cool feature, and I got to play with this thanks to the Business Partner su Summit, is multi-foundation support in Server Manager. Uh, and it just works. It's really cool. A lot of setting up multi-foundation is a rather manual process, very, very time-consuming, detailed. You got to rename folders. You got to get into the deployment server. Um, you got to create the foundations, et cetera. You can now do it in Server Manager. Um, but you also have to be very cognizant of your bitness and your foundations together so that you don't end up deploying out the wrong the wrong thing. Also, if you're going to be doing 32-bit and 64-bit together, you have to keep them, you have to have two sets of compiles, two separate sets of builds. So lots to consider there. Um, let's see, the other thing that um, I was able to locate, and I have not used this, is, is the P980060X, and it's an application for mo monitoring notifications. Uh, for those of you that have been um, uh, you know, listening to the, um, um, the in-focus sessions from Lyle and, and Ekdahl and his, um, and his um, people who work for him, there's been a lot about no alerting and notifications. Uh, a lot of um, third-party monitors uh, have, have done some of the functionality, but right now, uh, who better to go to than the, than the author of the program itself? And they are making a lot of alerting and available um, um, inside of E1 natively. Okay, so I mentioned, um, I'm just going to have a slide a little bit on subscriptions and, and notifications. Um, basically, it, 
it allows you to improve your business efficiency through proactive notifications. And you can, you know, basically they, they enable the system to notify you of certain events uh, without the need for, you know, having to be online. Um, and so several of the applications can be configured for this and then you can subscribe to these notifications and you choose how you want to get um, your message uh, via SMS, via email, or however you want, uh, want to get it. You have several options. Um, and you can add or delete your subscriptions over time. And again, to get to this, you need to be on tools 9224.56 or the 923 that's gonna be coming out. So it's a really nice feature that you can get alerting. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would say it's kind of like the watch list um, that you can get via text, but it's much more powerful than that. Um, it's built in uh, capability. So in order to be able to um, use a prerequisite for notifications, you have to enable it, of course. Um, and then, of course, you have to um, enable security. Um, one of the things that is very critical with the 9.2 series of tools releases is that Oracle is now locking things out for you by default. Whereas in the past, everything was opened up and you had to lock it down. Um, Today is a new world. Oracle has changed their philosophy and you now get everything locked down. Even if you are, if you're new to the 9.2 series and you have yet to implement user-defined objects, you're in for a couple day venture um, of understanding it. GSI has had to go in and, and open them up, uh, make some of those features wide open temporarily while people figure out how to um, implement their security model. As we do security for some people, clients and, so, and, and not others. So um, the last thing you want to do is install a new tools release and then you can't get to, to some of these key new features. So we, uh, we help them figure out how to open it up and, and then show them the security things that they need to, to, to lock, it, lock it out and or do an open model. So then basically you have to select what delivery message is that you want and, and, and set it in there. So there is a document um, around notifications and that is um, in this link right here. So it's in the tools, note. there's an Enterprise One Tools notification guide. Um, if you wanna learn more about this, this is a real big, big helper to your user community in doing their jobs better and understanding when things are supposed to happen a um, lot sooner than, than having to wait till next day to go in and pull data. You're getting data pushed to you now. So the object usage tracking is a, is a new feature in the 9.2 series. I think 9.2.2.1 is when it came out. I've, I've forgotten at this point. Um, very useful for deter um, keeping code current. Um, it'll tell you who's using Enterprise One, which objects are being um, being accessed. So right now it's for um, interactive applications, UBEs, and I think as of 9.2.2.1, that's when they also allowed business functions um, to come in. So uh, it'd be nice if we had this tool in some of the back releases. If you're still sitting on 9.0 or 9.1 and you're wanting to do an upgrade, might be worth looking into the tools release just to get the object usage tracking. You won't get, get, get the really cool analytic that comes with it because you got to be on 9.2 apps to get it, but if, if you want to use it as a tool to help you decide if you're going to take an application release, it'll tell you exactly what tool, um, what applications you're using. So you can look and see, hey, you know what, this application hasn't been used in months. Do we really need to retrofit it? There might be a good chance that you don't. Um, the other advantage is the object usage tracking can, can link directly into impact analysis so that you can um, you can find out how they all tie together based on what um, uh, what you're going to be doing. If you're going to take a, like an ASU or an ESU, you might be able to feed the results right into that. So we mentioned earlier that in the 922 series and higher, they moved objects into the database. That's the three things again are spec objects, which is your deployment server uh, files, print queue files, and media objects. So I'll talk about these individually. Spec objects, we're talking about business function, business view, res, anything with the .c, .h, et cetera. There's a one-time process to move those files um, into the database, and that's usually done via the package build process. So basically, you, you're looking to eliminate the need to have a file-based system. So it can simplify um, and reduce 
um, RIS, backup and recovery. Now you're only worrying about a database to backup rather than file system, making it easier to um, duplicate path codes. And, and this is a big reason, and that is migrating to the cloud. GSI has helped about 20 organizations move to the cloud. And we have to worry about getting data over there, but we also have to worry about getting file systems over there. So if those file objects were stored in the database, we'd only have to worry about one replication method. It would really be, be helpful to us. I mentioned the new history archive for object auditing. Um, a, lot, a lot of the big questions are, it's like, well, if these file-based objects get stored in the database, how do I get at, at them? Well, when it comes to the database, or excuse me, deployment server objects, you can export them as PAR files, which are just, you know, zip files, basically. Um, nice thing is, is you can, you capture the information every time the object is changed, including as they cross path codes. You know what, let's stop for a second and do a poll. I've been talking too much. Let me launch this poll here. Um, let's ask the, the, the question here, which tools base are you on right now? Um, are you on 9.7 or prior, 9.8, 9.0 or 9.1, or 9.2 or higher? So we'll give you about 30 seconds. About 65% of you had voted. We have to, a few people that uh, We're off doing other things. That kind of happens when you're on a webcast, other business comes in. So we're up to about 75%. We'll give you 10 more seconds and then I'll, I'll shut it down. All right, three, two, one. Okay, so let's close the poll. So it looks like, um, Almost everybody on the webcast is on 9.0 or, or 9.1 or 9.2 already. So let me share this with you. Um, so you can see, you can see that, you know, almost half of it's about 50/50 on on the latest tools, or you're on 9.2 or higher. So if you're on 9.0 or 9.1, 100% of this material applies to you. If you're already on 9.2, then only some of it does. So, all right, let's get back to our webcast here. Thank you for helping us um, with that. We just wanted to find out where you where you stood with it. Um, again, media objects can go into the database. There's a UBE to move the objects to the database. There is a UBE to move the deployment server files to the database too, but the preferred method is to use the package build process. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, you, you can do it. So there's a UBE. Now, the, the thing about um, about media objects is that it's an all or nothing thing at this point. You either move all of your media objects to the database or you don't. Um, the preferred method is, is to go to the database. That is the recommended. But there are always ramifications to this. Do you, you know, maybe your media objects are accessed by a third party application now. You know, maybe a CAD drawing program has to be able to get access to it and they need the actual file and can't, um, can't um, you know, doesn't have an interface. Um, there, are, there are tools like Create Form that, that doesn't really matter, although it seems like it's creating a PDF, it can actually get at the, the source object okay, so it's not, not as big of a deal. But you have to look at your third-party applications to make that decision. GSI did a webcast on should you move your objects to the database or not, might be worth looking into. Um, if you're, if, you know, there's, there's, database can be expensive storage. Uh, if you're using all flash and it's very it's very expensive and you now have your files sitting out on some low-end spinning disk it might be cheaper just to remain where you're at performance may not matter um, but if you know if all things being considered and if you're already on expensive storage or you've worked that out already then then consider moving it the third thing you can move to the um, to the database are your print queue objects. The, the preferred choice is to store them into the database, um, allowing for scalable batch queues and handling of large volumes of batch jobs. This is one of those that you don't have to do all or nothing. You can map um, um, you can you can map things just like you did in the past to different queues, and some can just go into the database. Some you could store locally. For instance, you might have some HR things that you don't want stored in the database, or they want stored locally. Um, my my advice would be to still store it in the database, but figure out some special database security that um, uh, will will secure it down. But um, 
your your choice. Same pros and cons as the others. Depends on um, where you're putting it, how much it costs you to to pay for the the disk storage, and how much you have available. So some benefits. Um, you know, package builds might be in preparation for remote builds, maybe even someday uh, mobile phone package builds. You know, a lot of CNC guys. Uh, it's happened to me Friday night, six or seven o'clock, out to dinner with the family, and I get the phone call. I need a package build, and then I got to buzz home. It'd be a lot easier if I just said, "Excuse me, folks, I got to step outside for a minute." You get on your phone, do the package build, launch it, and you come back and finish dinner. That'd be a lot nicer. So that I can see being of help to the CNC administrator. Um, you know, theoretically shorting the time for deployment. Um, multiple versions of the same objects on file-based objects. Uh, you know, if you make changes, it's kind of like uh, um, it's kind of like a backup. Um, you can stay current at the fraction of a cost. Building block to future long-term architectural changes. I keep hoping um, that we'll see a uh, virtual queue someday, so that you can get true active-active clustering. Maybe someday. Uh, managing databases and files can be complex. I can attest to that if you're moving to the cloud, um, it can be. But the biggie here is that eliminating folder shares to manage files, it does tighten security. Um, folder shares have been terrible over the years in, in, in being hacked. Um, GSI in 2016 had two clients that were down for three to four days because they didn't have um, proper security on their deployment servers and they got hit with the folder folder share. So that would have certainly helped them out a lot. Doesn't preclude them, they should have had um, better, um, um, you know, maybe better um, internet security um, or um, overall better security policy. But if you eliminate uh, an obstacle, it, you can't get hit. Um, just a few notes um, on this, um, package build times, um, you know, on the average takes eight to 12 hours for the server and four hours for the client and expect that first build um, while you're powering things up and to get into the database and then after that maybe expect an extra hour because you know you have to par files and and store them out to the database keep in mind you're always going to have to you're going to when you take a tools release you're going to always need your planner esu um, there's a roll-up ESU and automated special instructions. Be sure to check dependencies. Um, several of GSI's CNCs ran into issues where they didn't check dependencies and they got bitten, things didn't work. Um, if you're gonna use um, UX1, you absolutely have to have an AIS server. Now it can be an extra JVM on your existing web server. Some people choose to have um, a separate web server altogether just to um, not have any potential uh, load conflict. Um, you'll need a new change assistant. Um, for the, you probably expected that though as a CNC person. Um, update um, two is available as well. So nine, nine two, two, you know, application nine two update two, um, along with your your tools release. Um, and this um, this nine two, um, I should just put nine two dot x documentation is available. If you follow this link, it'll give you all of the um, the data that I mentioned um, earlier, the, the features that I, I put in will we'll take you to more detail on that. So again, um, the big announcement for the 923 is the addition of 64-bit for the enterprise server. Um, and um, with that, Caitlin, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I think I talked a little fast this time, so I'm, I'm done, done like three or four minutes early. That's fine. We got some questions. So. All right. Okay, and just very quickly, and thanks, John. Um, really quickly before we get to the Q and A section, I'm going to just go through a few things. Um, our webcast today is part of GSI's free ongoing educational webset, webcast series on JD Edwards. Um, our upcoming webcasts are listed on the screen, and to view our most up-to-date schedule, please visit getgsi.com forward slash webcast. Um, and please join GSI on November 29th for our UX1 workshop in Irvine, California. Um, we also have the Southern California Regional User Group on December 6th. And finally, on the same day, there is the Houston User Group 8th Annual Holiday Social Networking Event and, and Casino Night, sorry, 
Um, and you can find all of these on our website under conferences and events under the JD Edwards section. DSI provides extensive free educational resources for the JD Edwards community, including our weekly educational webcast, our monthly newsletter called the GSI Insider, our online resource center where you can access our on-demand webcasts, white papers, and more, and our on-site and virtual workshops. If you'd like to sign up for our weekly email reminders for upcoming webcasts, our monthly newsletter, or create an account to access our resource center, go to getgsi.com, then go to platforms on the main menu, then select JD Edwards, and then you can select the appropriate link on the left. Okay, and I see that we have several questions submitted online. I would like to remind everyone that if you'd still like to submit a question, you can do so using the questions panel in the GoToWebinar console on the window on the right side of your screen. If you minimized your console earlier, please click the left arrow to redisplay the questions panel. And John, the first question is, uh, will there be performance gains to moving to tools 9.2.3? Uh, interesting question. The, the answer to that is probably. Um, there, there are some specific UBEs. Um, don't expect um, quicker performance like sign in um, interactive application, but um, UBs um, could could very well have uh, some improvement in performance. Um, measurable, yes. Um, lightning noticeable, no. Don't expect um, uh, don't expect to say, "Wow, I've got to have this because because it's going to change my world with with performance." In some cases, that could be the case. Depends on the particular UBE. Okay, um, and we have one, um, looks like from George, and it says, is the notification feature part of the JDE orchestrator, or is it a separate standalone feature? Oh, I couldn't, hold on, I couldn't hear you, you were a little muffled. Oh, I'm sorry, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, okay, is the notification feature part of JDE orchestrator, or is it a separate standalone feature? It's both, It's it's a... It's part of Orchestrator, but it's also part of um, um, about Enterprise One as well. Okay, and then also from George is uh, what licensing restrictions exist with JDE Orchestrator? Okay, uh, George, I, I first and foremost, I want to say I um, uh, I'm speaking from what I believe here, um, and formally and officially, you should um, contact your Oracle. Uh, account executive, but it's my understanding that if you're licensed for um, Oracle technology stack, that the orchestrator is a part of it, um, included in in it. So again, please do contact Oracle. Though I don't, um, I don't want you to come back to me and say, "Hey, I got to pay for this." You you said it was free. I'm fairly certain it is, but I don't want to speak on behalf of Oracle Sales. Okay, um, and the last one is, what is GSI's advice on taking the tools release? Um, we could talk for days about taking tools releases. Uh, I would certainly recommend taking a new tools release once a year. Now, uh, I, I, I wouldn't recommend taking um, a .o tools release um, in the first 30 days. For instance, 923.0 comes out. Let's say it comes out next Friday. I would recommend waiting at least 30 days to let some of the uh, let some any any bugs come out of it. You know, Oracle does a lot of extensive testing, but it doesn't get its real thorough test until it's been released into the commu community. And 30 days is generally um, a good good advice on on that. Um, also, don't take the uh, you know it's you know if if you think the 923 64 bit is the save all in performance, it may or may not be it. You should do an evaluation on whether the performance will help you. It might not be worth taking if it if your only reason is performance. It might not be worth the disruption to the business if you're already getting reasonably good performance. Okay, and that looks okay. like the end of our Q&A. Um, I forgot to change the emails on that last slide, so I'm just going to uh, leave our information up here. The emails are very simple. It would be john.bassett at getgsi.com. 
And as a follow-up from today's webcast, we ask that you complete a short one-minute survey when you exit. You'll be receiving an email with a link to our resource center on our website where you can access the recording from today's webcast as well as a copy of the presentation. And after today's webcast, we will do the drawing for the $25 Amazon gift card. Anyone that attended the entire webcast will be eligible and we will notify the winner. If you have any follow-up questions, you can contact John or I and we will get back to you. Thanks again for attending our presentation and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.